Okay, so we'll make a start anyway, and hopefully Brian can catch us up. We'll put him on. So uh, welcome to this uh, this this uh, session anyway. This is um, a session on road safety for cycling, which is a really important um, topic, obviously. We've got um, some fantastic speakers who are, to be honest, um, uh, some of the top in their field. They're, um, um, I couldn't find three better experts at different levels in different countries. Um, we're often calling on, there's Brian. Okay, Brian's here. Um, we're often calling on their expertise here at, um, at ECF, and um, and they've been engaged in road safety in their various countries and abroad as well for many years um, at different levels, at national and uh, local level. Um, the idea is they'll give their particular take on cycling safety, infrastructure, policy, legislation in their own countries according to their own flavour of cycling and cycling safety. And then we'll probably try and have um, a quick question after each um, after each uh, presentation. Um, so put your questions in the chat. Um, don't do the Q&A, put them in the chat and I'll see if I can follow them. And then hopefully at the end, we'll have um, a, a few minutes or so to have a discussion um, and have a chat. Um, so if you have any questions, even if it's not to do with the presentations about cycling promotion and safety, then by all means, do put something in the chat. Um, we don't have translation for this, so I ask the speakers to speak nice and slowly. Um, and so we have, so let's go to um, uh, Hilly first. Um, Hilly, can I, so Hilly works for, uh, for, for Crow, which is um, a Dutch platform for transport, um, infrastructure and public space. Um, it's an NGO that advises uh, Dutch government, uh, regional and city administration, and also cycling organization like um, like Fietzersbond, for example, which is one of our members in um, uh, one of our members from ECF uh, in the Netherlands. Um, Hill is the project manager there, uh, responsible for the that's a world famous Crow Manual um, for bicycle traffic, um, a publication on trans bus bicycle transportation planning and engineering in the Netherlands, possibly one of the most influential documents on advanced cycling infrastructure um, and safety, both worldwide and in the Netherlands. Last updated 2016. And um, Hilly, over to you. We see your screen there. That's good. Okay. okay thank you for the introduction, uh, Hilly. I should have brought a copy to show to everybody, but um, <laughs> anyway. Um, and um, the news is that next year I uh, start uh, um, uh, evaluating the existing manual and starting for a new one uh, with all the new information that we've got. Well, now my presentation on safety in design, um, um, and I hope the buttons will work somehow. Do you see my next slide? Oh, that's always the danger with these new programs. Okay, so perhaps... Um... Shall we go to Brian? Brian, I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm Brian Deegan. I work for a consultancy called Urban Movement. I'm the technical director of walking and cycling. But really, what I'm talking about today is the is the role that fulfil for for various mayors and authorities. So I, I I advise like the mayors of London and Leicester and Manchester. So I'm really going to talk about um, the kind of national picture and road safety and how it affects cyclists in the UK. And my little subheading kind of tells it all there, kind of from road safety to road danger reduction. So you can see from the picture that we're actually doing quite well in London in particular, getting quite a lot of people cycling. Uh, I often like to quote that we've got more cyclists than Amsterdam in London now, albeit I could fit Amsterdam in one of the 33 boroughs of London and still have some change. So uh, that's one of the things you can do with stats. <laughs> we'll get to a few more as we go along. But there is something that we're, that we're doing well and we're starting to attract uh, a real growth in cycling. In fact, the Prime Minister has been calling it the golden age of cycling. But we've still got a long way to go, but there's something that we're doing well. I'm going to argue that it's a very different approach to, to road safety and a different framing of it. Um, that's that's what I'm going to kind of argue anyway. Let's let's get into it. Right, so, um, yeah, kind of uh, respectfully to the Parliamentary Advisory Council for Transport Safety, who are like a really leading authority in road safety in the UK, and he advised the ministers. And I really like this new document that they put out because it's something that we've been talking about in the cycling world for years, because uh, it, it's always the case that why would you promote cycling when cycling is less safe than other modes? 
And that was always like a, the issue that we had with business cases for drawing down large pots of money from government. But anyway, like, there's a very different approach to it now. And I, I particularly like this graph, which is blunt and to the point, but then road safety often is. What kills whom? Now, if we look at the table, you can see the vehicles involved on the on the axis on the left there. And at the bottom, it's like, a well, what vehicle was the person who were killed in there? And there no, should be no surprise, but it's often stated that cars are the ones that are killing the most people. If we go along from uh, from cars and look at cyclists, you can see that it far outweighs it. So just, I thought that was a really interesting reframing because normally when governments and, and our government and particularly talk about road safety, they show like the, the absolute numbers compared to other countries and or, or maybe show that as a rate, the absolute numbers that we got, well, there's hardly any cyclists uh, being killed in the UK. And we go, well, there's hardly any cyclists. And and Kerry once told me a stat, which I'll share now, that um, if, if the UK was literally not a part of Europe, then the whole mode share for cycling would go up a full 1%. So that gives you an idea of how much we're lagging behind. But I think this reframing uh, should help. Let's have another look at a couple of data. So just to spell this out, because it's always been like anything we do for cyclists is going to be um, to, to mitigate the dangerous effects of cars, really. And this this... These kind of graphics really help show it. it's it's cars that are killing cyclists in the vast majority of cases. And it's just, it's good to see this acknowledged. So I'll go through a, a couple more things to set the scene. This is the one that you could look at. If you looked at this, okay, what the total amount of deaths that are happening, you say, well, it's cars, uh, that's the case and uh, causing it for other people and themselves. So you think, well, we really need to do something to make cars safer. And actually there's not that many cyclist deaths. There's a lot more in uh, in Holland, for example. But then if we look at like um, like what actually kills other people, you see it's the kind of cars that get in there. So the number of uh, um, pedestrians and cyclists and killed by car. I'm going to jump on. There's a few stats here to get into, but I really don't want to dwell. I want to get into what we're doing about it. So yeah, there's a total deaths involved by each mode. And, and this is the interesting one now, because you look at it more as a rate based. And actually you can see by billion, uh, per billion passenger miles traveled, actually cars are really safe, even though the majority of the actual collisions cause, really it's motorbikes that are the biggest worry. And you can see cycling then comes a lot bigger than cars. And and this is the rate that we've been asking of government from the cycling um, world for years, because we've been saying we're hardly any cycling collisions, but per distance traveled, we're well, actually one of the worst in Europe. And that's why we need to tackle it so this, this kind of reframing helps us make the case. Also looking at there, you can see the, the pedestrian ones as well, way more. So actually it's riskier walking than it is riding a bike in the UK, which is a really interesting thing that I wasn't particularly expecting. Anyway, so what are we doing about it? Let's, let's go for it at a kind of national level. Um, there's this document that came out last summer uh, from the government and it's, uh, it's a real breath of fresh air. It's like a whole new vision for walking and cycling um in the uk plus like money to go along with it it's not as much as our roads budget but it's it's getting pretty good we're talking in the billions and that's uh, particularly useful but one of the things it says it says that cyclists must be physically separated and protected from high volumes of motor traffic at junctions and on the stretches of road between them and that's a that's a hell of a statement it's got that word must which is really important to engineers like me because uh, when we use the word must and it's coming from a government source, it implies there's some kind of legal issue if you don't do it. So we're saying now, and it is a way of tackling like um, um, road safety issues, that on a busy road, cyclists must be protected. Really obvious to people from like uh, Holland and Denmark, but not necessarily obvious to us. And it's the first time the government's ever really made bold statements like this saying you must protect them. It's more, it used to be the case of, well, if they do it, they do it, you know, off they go and we train people how to deal with like difficult situations now we're saying they shouldn't be subjected to that difficult situation so for, for us this is a this is a big change a gear change if you will the big things that are happening in the uk that i think are part of this whole reframing is that is the highway code and how how road users get around in the road the, the rules and regulations they're being updated and there's a much greater emphasis on on protecting vulnerable road users. This uh, so-called hierarchy of road users is really interesting. It places those road users most at risk, the event collision at the top of the hierarchy. So 
when you look at the figures, it'd be walking and cycling and motorcyclists. You'd have to put them at the top of that hierarchy, albeit in reality, um, it starts with uh, walking and cycling, and then um, you know, then down to motorcyclists. But still, it's uh, it's interesting to reframe it. And the second bit's really important as well is in what they're looking at doing. So, those in charge of vehicles that cause the greatest harm in the effect in the event of a collision bear the greatest responsibility. This is a uh, this is not news to Dutch colleagues, but it's uh, it's very much news to us. We're saying, actually, it's the danger you cause. It, it used to be a case, well, given that cars and trucks are on the roads, what do we do to pe keep people away from it? Guard rail them away, put them on underpasses. But now we're saying, actually, no, those people in those dangerous vehicles but, uh, bear the brunt of the responsibility. So again, I think a, a real game changing moment in the UK if we can get this right. Um, so in the UK at the moment, we're really juggling lots of things. It's, uh, it's interesting that the whole Vision Zero thing, I'm going to show you some examples of us trying to adopt that, that kind of Swedish practice, the kind of safe systems, sustainable safety stuff that, that's come out so well from Holland, which I'm sure Hilly will talk about. And our own kind of road danger reduction, I'm showing you a little picture there. It's actually from a Dutch campaign, but it's shown in like a, a, the original manual for road danger reduction. So we stopped talking about road safety and we start thinking about the danger that different modes cause to others and then it's a very different phrase and it's like you move towards like a thinking about protecting people rather than keeping away and keeping them safe because you want people out being active so um lots of the policy that's coming through national and starting to drip through to the kind of regional level is kind of juggling these three systems and that's great to see we know like uh, you know we've got some brilliant road safety policies and uh, road safety audit in the in the uk is like uh, one of the best in the world i'd say but this this reframing is what's happening nationally and i think it's it's really important if we're going to get more people cycling so let's have a look at a few kind of regional examples here's from london you can see they very much adopted the vision zero approach they've got a vision zero action plan it ties in with the kind of healthy streets um program which is what we've got in the kind of middle there so and, and i wanted to read it out there reduce the dominance of motor traffic this is a uh, london's mayoral strategy for transport and i think that's it's really bold most people in london don't own cars and yet they are the ones causing their, all the fatalities um and you can see on the right there but what's what's also interesting about the graphs on the right i've, I've shown quite a lot of information here and that you can look it up because I've shown the sources. Well, HGVs are really overrepresented as well. And that was the real case when we we're looking at keeping cyclists safe in, in London in particular. What can we do about HGV fatalities? Um, and you can see an acknowledgement of speed as well. We're trying to move towards like um, 20 miles an hour, the equivalent of 30 kilometers an hour in Europe. I'll do a quick translation there. Just acknowledging that even on some of our major roads, um, transport problems starting to push that out. And you can see there's like a zero figure in the middle. So 70% uh, reduction in all KSIs killed, seriously injured, and, and a zero. The first time we've ever used zero in any kind of road safety uh, plan, albeit it's just for buses by 2030. We've got a long way to go before we can uh, achieve true vision zero, particularly in a city the side of London, but pretty impressive. So let, let's have a look at some of the things they're doing to resolve this. It's when I get more into my comfort zone now, cycle infrastructure. But this is like a, a kind of like a London based approach that we came up with uh, several years ago. Now, the, the so called hold the left junction. And you can see from the lights, you have to imagine that you, you drive on the same side as the road as us. You see, there's a green light for cyclists to go ahead, but then there's a red light next to it. And that's for the left turning to be the equivalent of your right turners. Uh, so the left turning cars never go at the same time as cyclists go ahead. It's held into a different stage in the signal cycle. But you can just about see on the lights on the right hand side that the head cars are going. So you've got green for a head cars at the same time as green for a head cyclist. But the left turning cars are held into a different stage. Just extremely safe way of doing it. Plus you don't have cyclists waiting ages and ages for their own stage. So we've got quite peculiar signal rules in the UK. You get lots of green time to get through a junction. So we're, we're having a lot of set success in London with this approach. And I think it's worth worth doing. And, and you've got to remember as well, in the UK, we don't have the yield on turn rule. So we have to separately signal things. We can't rely on drivers giving way in the junction before they turn. They don't. So we have to be quite strong about it with this. 
particularly with HGVs, we had quite a lot of the HGV left turning fatalities, which brought us to do this sort of thing in the first place. I'll crack on. The other thing that London's doing well is like a low traffic neighbourhoods. They've rolled out about 200 of these things so far and like uh, about 4% of the population's um, got them, which is basically like a, not the old classic, like a drop a planter in the middle of the road and, and don't let cars through, but let people walking and cycling pass through, and in some cases, emergency vehicles as well. And that, that's what that sign means, the, the so-called blind motorcycle sign that we've got. And it's associated with a camera. That's what the other sign on the on the there. So any car that's gone through there will get fined. So it's just people cycling. So we can get really quiet kind of residential neighborhood areas. And, that, and how does that fit into the road safety one? Well, we looked at some analysis and I want to point out the graph on the left first, just to show what's been happening, what a trend is in the UK. I'm sure everybody's feeling this trend as well. You can see in the last 10 years on our kind of C roads, which are like our residential style roads, not the important A and B roads, which are the, the big trunk ones. They've been kind of trending down, but the C roads, like a massive increase, almost a doubling in traffic and a Many reasons for this. It could be like home deliveries. It could be like ways and Google Maps and everybody knowing where the shortcuts are now. But well, we really have to tackle that because it's meant a big like increase in collisions as well. So one of the things of doing these kind of filters and, and stopping cars from going through and letting cyclists and, and people walking go through is that like a, you can see it corresponds with a, with a huge um, road traffic injury risk per trip. A drop of 70% of collisions there. So that's what the graph on the right shows where we do do this. There's a huge drop in collisions and there's also a reduction in street crime and uh, um, lots of evidence coming out on this, which I'd love to share with you all day. But in, like a, a, in road safety terms, you can't stuff your nose at that one. We've got a doubling of traffic, but we've got something that vastly reduces the injury risk to people inside and has no real perimeter effect either. So um, London's way ahead. I uh, thought I'd show some of the stuff from Manchester as well. That's the, the mayor, Andy Burnham, holding the bike and the commissioner, who I work with, uh, Chris Board, she worked with both of them. And I've got really impressive plans at the moment to do 500 miles of new walking and cycle routes by 2024, 100 kilometres going in this year. Um, and they're also working on a road danger reduction plan. So again, like that kind of policy that's kind of filtering through from government that's coming through from the major sources is starting to hit the regions and we're starting to change the way we look at things. Let's have a look at a couple of things that they're, they're doing in Manchester. So the Manchester approach to junction design, which is where 80% of the collisions involving cyclists happen. That's why I'm, I'm focusing on junctions here. Is there, it's, it's a Dutch inspired protected junction. We called it the Cyclops Junction. The, um, but for various reasons, I won't go into because I haven't got time. But you basically got a circulating cycle stage that goes at the same time as the pedestrians. So we kind of route cyclists round in a kind of roundabout motion. Um, um, so it keeps them safe. We've got a separation in time and space, which is like a, the Dutch mantra that we're trying to apply to all our junctions at the moment. We can't um, perhaps use some of the Danish approaches where we're relying on good driver behavior and that yielding and turn effect. So we're trying to get this separation and what we're really happy about this is it's like a, it's actually more efficient than just standard UK layouts, which is why this scheme that you're looking at here was actually a bus scheme that we put through. It had benefits for all modes and all users. And uh, we think that's the case because we've got kind of short pedestrian crossings. And I won't get into too much about British uh, traffic law, but we're trying to do Dutch style approaches, even though some, some Dutch people have been a little bit snotty with me about it, I have to say. We're, we're trying to do Dutch inspired um, approaches, but doing it in our own way with our own regulations. And uh, the first couple of these have gone in now and uh, they've gone to great success as well. And I've, have I run out of time? I can hear someone shouting at me, but I'll carry on for another couple of minutes. Um, no, you're fine. You're fine, Brian. You can go on for a couple of minutes. Don't worry. Oh, brilliant. OK, so just a, just a couple of things that are really being rolled out across the UK now as well. So again, that whole like a uh, must must protect cyclists when there's heavy volumes of traffic. The whole of the UK is getting into that now, and we've had like a uh, particularly during COVID, we had our our pop up cycleways um, that have been happening, and these kind of things like uh, the protected bike lane stuff. Like uh, this is a an object called a one dorker, and I did a paper for the OECD and, uh, um, about uh, light protection, but we've really been pushing it in the UK and. The vast majority of English regions have all given this stuff a go now. Some of these things are like a 
60, 70 euros each. You put them on a cycle lane, you got 100% success record of stopping cars driving into that space, which then encourages people to actually give cycling go in the first place. So this one here is like a, one of the examples. We, we got the idea from Spain with uh, some of the Zikla range, but we're, we're been a real mass rollout of this stuff right across the UK and we're, we're really doing the benefits. It helped during the COVID crisis when we were trying to get people around, but we couldn't get them on the buses, went out with lots of this kit, started protecting all the cycle lanes that were there, and then people go into the NHS and to hospitals and work, were more encouraged to do so by bike. So we've had a big boost in cycling as a result. And that's a, that's a UK wide thing. Uh, one of the things we're also looking at as well is the cycle streets and the also pedestrian priority streets as well. So there's a few um, very Dutch looking things going on there. I know the Germans do it as well, but that's a, that's as close to a kind of Utrecht style layout as we can get in the UK. But, but these things are happening where, where there's no overtaking cyclists, where it's a kind of slower design speed. Um, we're starting to roll more and more of these things out. I hope they really take off. And just to finish off, really, like the, the Prime Minister's saying, let's make this a golden age of cycling. And there's a target of like 50% of all short trips to be made by walking and cycling over the next 10, 15 years as a result of a, a to tackle like decarbonisation plans. Um, yeah, we've really moved on with the game. And I'm kind of showing in these two pictures the contrast. These are 10 years apart. And we're trying to move from that kind of road safety perspective of someone having to train a cyclist and how to deal with a hostile situation, you know, and it's fun getting out there, but like you've got the car right behind and the stress of it to the to one on the right where this is from London, it's not from Copenhagen or or Amsterdam. We've got people that are just enjoying the cycling culture. They're protected where they need to be protected. They're kind of filtered on the back streets and they can just go about doing their business. They don't have to get the equipment. They don't have to be trained. And that for us is like a is true road safety fire road danger reduction and i'll uh, i've summed it all up there i think and that's the uh the end of my effort i think thanks uh brian brilliant that's bang on time as well um i i think we'll go straight on to the next one because we don't have um we we lost a bit of time at the start with some technical issues so um if you want to put some questions by the way put them in the chat so we can but i think we'll try and have a chat later with uh with brian on some of the things he's been talking about there Perhaps if we can go to Marachin. Uh, let me just introduce you to Marachin. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Um, yeah, Marachin. Marachin. Uh, Marachin is a uh, vice president of uh, Miasta de la Rovberov, um, Cities for Bicycles in Poland, uh, Polish national cycling organization, which he founded in 1995. Uh, author, freelance journalist and activist. Um, in 1999, he developed the uh, implemented the Gdansk Cycling Infrastructure Promotion Project, author of technical standards for cycling in Krakow, Poznan, and other municipalities. Um, he led a successful campaign by um, Cities for Bicycles to overhaul the cycling legislation, which we'll talk about in this as well, I think, um, and has worked as an in house cycling expert for the Poland's National Road Administration. Um, consultation on local governments and cycling policies um, and he'll be looking at the history of Polish cycling with a particular look on road codes and that's what he did in 2011. Okay over to you Marcin. Uh Do you see my presentation? We see the first one yep let's go to the second one Just... okay that's good that seems to be working all good now. Okay. Okay uh... I'm gonna hide away. Uh, okay, uh, you introduced me, so I just go on to the topic, Poland cycling laws and cycling safety. Uh, Poland is not to be confused with Holland, uh, which prefers to call itself the Netherlands. Uh, Poland is the perhaps uh, other uh, end of the cycling spectrum. Poland is not a benchmark for uh, cycling, is not a benchmark for road safety in general. Uh, cycling in Poland was mostly restricted to rural areas. Uh, bicycle was poor man's transport. And probably uh, this started changing uh, around 2000, maybe 2010, notably with the uh, GEF funded uh, Gdańsk Cycling Project 20 years ago. Now, uh, cycling sprung to visibility, I'd say. It's uh, about 6% of all traffic in most advanced cities. Uh, in the city of Poznan, it's 8.4%. Uh, 
uh, but uh, no figures are available for uh, all country. What we do have are some uh, very rudimentary statistics uh, on accidents. Uh, what you see at the diagram, the blue uh, part of the diagram, or green part of the diagram, uh, is all accidents from 2007 through 2020, uh, cyclist accident. And there is no visible trend at uh, 2018 was a kind of a peak. Then there was a very wet and 2019 with a decrease in cycling and 2020 is general decrease in mobility due to COVID. At the bottom, we have uh, fatalities. Uh, the navy blue part is uh, seriously injured uh, cyclists. So there is no clear trend, but when you come to uh, just uh, numbers, in 2007, 516 cyclists were killed, and in 2020, 250. 250 too many, but that's half of the figure of 2007. Uh, unfortunately, we have no data on uh, cycle traffic nationwide, and this actually should be superimposed on this uh, diagram. But data from larger cities uh, suggest huge growth in cycling. In Dynsk, it was 25%. In Krakow, it was 43%. Growth between 2017 and 2020. Uh, these are the automatic bicycle counters. So this is rather anecdotal uh, data rather than scientific data, but it's still there. What might be of some interest uh, is the major cycling overhaul of highway code in Poland. Uh, Poland was not a cycling country, and somehow it cared for cyclists in a very peculiar way. Poland somehow didn't recognize the uh, Vienna Convention on Road Traffic part uh, on cycling. This is the Article 16, Paragraph 2. In fact, this article was deliberately removed from Highway Code for cyclist safety uh, in, in, in inverted commas. Uh, also, uh, there was a problem that cyclists had to yield to all traffic entering cycle crossings. So actually, it was uh, not uh, quite obvious reason to build cycling infrastructures and it stopped uh, cyclists at every, every junction. Uh, this is what the Vienna Convention reads, but perhaps a picture will show it better. Uh, it goes without saying in most uh, civilized countries in the world, cars turning right here yields to cyclists traveling straight ahead to the right on the picture. Uh, in Poland, it was reversed for cyclist safety, so to say. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, highway code reform from 10 years ago changed it and streamlined highway code with the Vienna Convention. So now all traffic changing direction must yield to cyclists riding straight forward. Also, uh, uh, cyclists uh, no longer must yield to all traffic entering cycle crossings, general rule supply and traffic signs and signals, which actually uh, leads to some uh, problems. Uh, minor changes of interest, uh, well, the uh, new highway code introduced advanced stop lines, uh, pedal legs. Cyclists may ride to abreast and to take full lane. Also, uh, it might be of some interest uh, outside Poland. Uh, Poland differentiated between cycles, bicycles, and bicycle carts. Uh, bicycle is defined by width. Uh, this is a bicycle as long as it is uh, 90 centimeters wide. And the reason for that is backward compatibility with existing infrastructure. On the other hand, bicycle uh, carts or rickshaws, probably, uh, velo taxis, they are uh, too narrow for uh, compulsory cycle tracks. Uh, what is the context of the highway code? Uh, changes were introduced at the last possible moment before major rise in bicycle traffic, at least in major cities, and before most cycling infrastructure was built in Poland. And uh, uh, this was a huge uproar in Poland. Uh, there were suggestions that it will cause a uh, slaughter of uh, bicycles, will be uh, dangerous to 
give um, cyclists those privileges, as it was said. Uh, the safety output is uh, the opposite. We have fewer deaths, still definitely too many, fewer seriously injured, more accidents, uh, especially in cities, but this can be obviously explained by very grave in cycling. However, the decrease in fatalities uh, can be attributed to construction of new uh, roads outside built areas that diverted heavy traffic uh, through traffic uh, from uh, narrow roads that were uh, shared with local cyclists. Uh, what's the situation right now? Well, uh, in some cities in Poland, uh, there happen to be streets that have more bicycle traffic than car traffic. Of course, uh, <laughs> these are exceptions. But visibility in some parts of Poland speaks volumes. This is Poland. This is not the Netherlands. This is quite, quite a success to see this uh, kind of uh, parking, uh, uh, bicycle parkings. But the uh, highway code reform uh, and the follow-up led to many discussion and misunderstanding on some issues like cycle crossing priority. We do have problems with isolated crossings, with broken priorities, and these may be legal problems in the future once uh, accidents happen there. And now it's a uh, driver training problem. Uh, what is quite important and I think might be interesting uh, for uh, people outside Poland, Poland is a non-cycling uh, transition country, transition from non-cycling to, well, aspirational cycling and uh, may serve as a test bed for issues overlooked in advanced cycling societies. And this is what I'm going to discuss right now. Uh, there was a huge discussion on giveaway signs at traffic crossings. Here we have a truck, a heavy good vehicle, just on a bicycle crossing with a yield sign uh, at the poorly designed turbo roundabout. Actually, this Turbo roundabout was so, so badly designed that they had to put traffic lights here because of uh, cars hitting one another. Uh, no accidents with cyclists were reported, uh, luckily. Uh, but there are some other issues. The yield sign uh, should be placed at uh, some bicycle crossings, and they are missing, like here. And uh, broader lessons learned and some challenges ahead. By well, uh, introdu introducing those uh, changes in Polish law, we looked very closely at Vienna Convention on road traffic, on road signs, on European agreements supplementing the Vienna Convention, and stress test these uh, international agreements uh, with our national lovely bureaucracy and uh, interpretations. And also, there are some uh, issues uh, when we have road geometry that is not compatible with uh, traffic rules. Uh, perhaps I will skip those uh, uh, details, legal uh, details, but there is a uh, quite an important, well, not from a Dutch perspective, of course, but from Polish perspective, quite interesting. Uh, a question, is bicycle crossing, which is a road sign and marking part of a roadway, carriageway, or part of a cycle track? Does emerging from cycle track oblige to give way? Uh, this is Article 18, Paragraph 2 of the Vienna Convention, and this is why in Poland uh, cyclists had to give way to everyone entering uh, bicycle crossing. Also, there seems to be a problem with Vienna Convention on Road Traffic Article uh, 16 paragraph 2 at turbo roundabouts, a very fine uh, Dutch invention uh, that work perfectly well unless there are cyclists and pedestrians on it. Uh, one of the things uh, connected to turbo roundabouts is signage. Uh, actually, this should be incorporated in uh, Vienna Convention on Road Signs. Uh, Polish bureaucracy somehow does not want to have them in uh, a Polish Highway Code because they are not in a Vienna Convention. But more importantly, uh, the traffic rules at turbo roundabouts or uh, large, poorly designed roundabouts like this one. Uh, geometry of this red uh, cycle track somehow conflicts with traffic uh, leaving the roundabout. 
So perhaps we should discuss uh, uh, traffic rules here or uh, signage uh, for this traffic uh, for, for, for this turbo roundabout. Also, uh, which actually might be quite an issue both in the UK and in the Netherlands, um, uh, there's something known as the Dutch roundabout. Okay, as long as uh, uh, it is not made Polish style, if you look closely at it, the island is to the left. And you can actually drive through this roundabout straight ahead at 100 kilometers per hour, hitting a cyclist uh, at the cycle track around the uh, Dutch styled, supposedly, uh, roundabout. The uh, black car leaving uh, the roundabout travels straight, straight ahead. So perhaps it is better to keep cyclists in. Uh, in the road, not on a segregated bicycle uh, track. You see uh, five or six cyclists here uh, traveling a full lane or to abreast. So perhaps uh, uh, you can uh, look at some solutions uh, uh, critically and adapt to uh, a local uh, situation. Uh, also, there might be a need for discussion on some new traffic signs and signals. And uh, the problem is uh, mostly with uh, signals for, uh, uh, for, 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 for cyclists. Actually, uh, the previous uh, presentation showed a, uh, sign, uh, a signal for bicycles in London. It was fine, but here in the amber light, you don't probably see the uh, silhouette of a bicycle. Uh, here you have green light, but you don't see it's just for cyclists. Uh, this should be done like that. And probably uh, the Vienna Convention needs some clarification because national bureaucracy in Poland says uh, this is the only way it can be done. Uh, also, we probably may need uh, non-mandatory uh, cycle facilities and signs for it. Uh, the Germans uh, have similar uh, signage. And uh, at the very end of this presentation, uh, there is one uh, particular problem that uh, touches Poland and Polish traffic engineering. Uh, here we see a low abiding cyclist in the middle of a road turning left to reach cycle track uh, it is on the left, not visible here. Uh, sign in the circle is uh, no entry for bicycles. Uh, this was arranged for safety, or security, safety uh, reasons. But the result is sadly this. This is a dash cam uh, uh, still. Uh, the uh, accident fortunately wasn't fatal, but uh, the... Uh, Cycling infrastructure uh, should be uh, organized, should be uh, built on the side of the road corresponding to the direction of traffic. Left turning uh, in the right hand traffic is extremely uh, dangerous for cycling and probably uh, this should be taken into account if we uh, try to uh, introduce cycling to less developed uh, 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 countries. Okay, I think that's all from me. Uh, I hope you heard everything and it was visible. I'm trying to uh, close this presentation. Thanks, uh, Maricin. Um Yeah, I think that's interesting about um, the fact that uh, some Dutch infrastructure simply doesn't work elsewhere. I think that's that's interesting. Perhaps we can talk about that later in the um, if we get time for a discussion. Speaking of which, uh, flawless segue into um, into Hilly and uh, talking about um, the Dutch, how the Dutch solve all these problems. Um, let me just introduce you, Hilly. Um, um, Hilly is I've already introduced you, haven't I, Hilly? I have from Crow Dutch Platform for Transport. Um, and she is the project manager um, of Crow, um, the world leading um, Crow organization, which has everyone has their books, including Brian and Marjan. 
Okay, over to you, Hilly. Well, um, I had a dress rehearsal, and I hope now it, it will work. Um, and, and thank you for the uh, introduction and uh, for Brian and Martin that they um, did uh, also a bit presentation about how we solve things in the Netherlands. Um, and I liked the, the extra that Martin uh, added uh, in Polish design, so Dutch uh, solutions with Polish design. Um, my presentation is partly on safety and health and more about details in the infrastructure. But first of all, I, I want to say that I'm a fan of the theory of uh, safety in numbers. So the more people you get on the bicycle, uh, the, the safer it will get. And then the, this diagram, with, I, I tried to prove my theory. Um, you see, in the Netherlands, we've got a huge amount of cyclists and uh, a, a very no amount, a uh, small amount of uh, fatalities, people killed per billion kilometers traveled. Well, I think you are all familiar with this theory. Uh, and also that's what uh, Kiria uh, asked me to show is um, if people change from car to uh, bicycle, it could be more dangerous. So maybe it would uh, get more people killed. But if you uh, look at the age group of 18 to uh, 29, I would say, then you can see on the top uh, uh, diagrams that they are uh, an accident prone. So they are very risky in, in uh, road traffic when they are a car driver. But if they change to uh, bicycle use, then, then you can see the uh, uh, lower uh, diagrams. Then they are um, pretty, pretty safe because um, as young drivers, they are very um, uh, inexperienced and, and overconfident in that age group. But as cyclists, they are very experienced and, and uh, 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 very um, fast and uh, quick with their uh, reactions. So they are safe cyclists and poor car drivers. So that's another uh, reason to make young uh, adults change from car use to um, bicycle use promote the use of the bicycle. And then um, some of you might have seen this diagram, uh, safety and health. Um, it's very important that, that people uh, start cycling. In the Netherlands, we are a very um, healthy uh, people, um, according to uh, uh, international organizations. We have a life expectancy of um, uh, more than uh, al almost 250 uh, days uh, in good health because we cycle so much. And that's the same, that's in when uh, people in the age group of 18 till 64 change from car use to um, and cycling. Um, and, and they lose only a few days in life expectancy when uh, because of uh, unsafety on the roads in the Netherlands on the bicycle. Uh, and they even lose more. And that's what many uh, policymakers do not have in mind, but they lose more days uh, of life expectancy uh, because they cycle in polluted air. And, and that's why we say, uh, and that's what my uh, uh, bottom pictures show, uh, look for um, uh, parallel alternatives further away from busy streets. Don't build them uh, as, as the easiest way, the separate of the, the protected bike lanes, but look for a parallel alternative and um, invest money in making them attractive for uh, cyclists that will gain much more safety and, and health. Um, well, I've got, I've written down some uh, advantage. The uh, um, life expectancy um, will, will grow um, in extra, in good health, and, and it reduces the, the, the uh, risk of um, all, uh, all dangerous, diseases, many dangerous diseases. Children are fitter and less overweight and more self-confident and reduces the cost of health care. So health is, is as, as important as safety. And we have to keep that in mind. And, um, and if you uh, want to design safe cy uh, cycle facilities, then you have to keep all the users in mind. And, and in my uh, role as um, project uh, manager for the, the design manual, I always have my mother, my 88 years old mother, that's I say all ages between eight and 88. My, my mother still uh, does her um, shopping or, or groceries, groceries to the supermarket in the supermarket. She goes on a bicycle. Can still live independently thanks to the uh, 
the fact that she can still use the bicycle. She, she is not allowed to use the car anymore, but cycling is all right for her. Well, the cyclists are human beings, so be, uh, betray them like human beings. It's a balanced uh, vehicle, so you have to uh, make sure that they can uh, cycle with a certain speed to keep the balance. And to um, make good bicycle facilities, it's not only um, good to make um, uh, um, parts of the, the road network uh, acceptable for cyclists, but you need a, a network for cycling. And a, a basic network, that doesn't have to be so difficult. That's what Brian also showed, what's happening in London. Sharing the uh, street at a low uh, speed. Cycle streets can be a solution to that. And it's to connect schools and shops and, and a coherent network that you are sure that if you leave home on a bicycle that you can reach your destination on a, a, in the network. Excuse me. So, uh, road designs, this is typical Dutch road design. And streets like this are perfect to use, to go uh, by on a bicycle. Um, sometimes you need traffic calming elements. And you need shortcuts to make sure that the cycling is faster around the city than uh, using the car. <coughs> then you have the main bicycle network for the, the urban network, as we call it. Urbly separate facilities, the different colors, so everyone can recognize the facilities to connect city centers, uh, job uh, areas, and uh, suburbs. Also, a coherent network that you have to choose for more than one route. Well, uh, infrastructure that, that can be used is uh, cycle lanes, um, as we have them, or uh, cycle streets. Brian also showed a fine example of uh, cycle streets. And then you have uh, interurban routes. This is not a network, but more routes, uh, bicycle highways connect places. And, and bicycle highways are a good instrument to make uh, cyclists compete with cars. We found that um, if only 5% of all people um, in congestion in uh, rush hours would change from a car to a bicycle, then you will, would uh, lower the uh, congestion with 12%. So it, it is quite a, a figure to invest in uh, uh, bicycle highways. <coughs> in the Netherlands, we would love to, to design bicycle highways like the left uh, picture. It's quite similar to um, uh, motor car highways, but then for the cyclists. But if you do not have that space and not so much money, you can also stick to the right side. But keep in mind that it needs to be very attra attractive, very safe, direct, <coughs> and with a design speed of 40, at least 45 kilometers per hour because the speed was lax and all the fast cyclists uh, would love to uh, use this one. And then you can compete with cars in uh, uh, commuting. Oh, yeah, we also have cycle uh, path. You can have separate uh, cycle path or a parallel cycle path to protect it. What you need for that. And uh, the picture at the top left is uh, a, a sign that we use for a cycle path that uh, people can choose to use, but they can also choose to uh, use the main road. <clears throat> we uh, have a, a difference between uh, legal uh, difference between the moped and the, and the cyclist. And when uh, the picture only shows a, uh, a bicycle, then um, it's allowed to be used only by cyclists only when we have a moped and um, a bicycle on the sign then it's a, a combination path for these two uh, vehicle types. And um, <clears throat> uh, well, then the, in, the intersections, these are the roundabouts that we design. And what we do, do is um, the um, connecting roads, they uh, uh, have a, a radial connection. So the, the street goes direct to the island and then uh, motorized traffic has to make a, a turn to go around the island. Um, uh, not like uh, the previous speaker showed in Poland, that you can almost uh, go straight ahead. Here in the Netherlands, where we design uh, roundabouts, 
uh, huge circle. The circle should be wider than the connecting streets. And then um, you really have to make a turn. And then the speed is low. So in case of any uh, incident or accident, um, then the result will be not so uh, serious uh, because speed is low. And um, oh yes, that's something nice, but maybe in the UK they have the same as well. We have an annual competition on circle design. And uh, the um, uh, bottom left picture shows uh, one of the winning uh, designs where they used uh, all vehicles to, um, yeah, make, to um, dress up the island. <clears throat> we also have uh, protected intersections, uh, more similar to what uh, Brian uh, is copying to, to the UK. Uh, where the bicycles have a square around, uh, use a square of a cycle path around the uh, uh, intersection, sometimes with and sometimes without priority. And uh, for those of you who are uh, in, in, in doubt, when the um, uh, pavement is red, <clears throat> then uh, it, the, uh, all traffic has to yield for cyclists, and when it's not red, then the bicycle has to, the cyclist has to yield. Uh, we do not have so many um, unsignalized intersections anymore. Uh, most of them are turned into roundabouts and others uh, do have traffic lights. And then you have this case of tunnels and bridges. And I always explain that uh, cyclists prefer uh, tunnels over bridges because with the speed you go down, you're halfway up and sometimes you're all, uh, uh, you are uh, back at the, at the street level in, in uh, tunnels like the top left uh, picture shows. <clears throat> On the other hand, with a, with a bridge, you can make a, a landmark, uh, like the Hoven ring, the bottom uh, right picture. Um, but then uh, tunnels can be a piece of art, like the uh, bottom left picture shows. And then the details. It's, it's easy to design elements and then uh, to make a rough design. But uh, like Marcin also showed, is that the details are very important. Um, I found some um, remarkable details, like uh, the bollards, to prevent cars from using bicycle facilities. You can't place a, a pole, a, a bollard in the middle of a street or a cycle street. That's a hazard. You have to make introducing market markings, rumble strips, use a flexible pole, um, and sufficient space to pass. Otherwise, you introduced more risk than safety um, for a um, separate facility. And then drainage also be a hazard. In the Netherlands, we put the drainage in, into the curb and not in the middle of a cycle lane or uh, in the middle of the street where you can get stuck or uh, where it's very uncomfortable. And if you need to um, um, place man covers in the street, then make sure that the uh, narrow side is in the driving uh, direction and not the long side, so that you, well, otherwise you would make a par uh, bicycle parking place instead. Work zones. Um, you can't just uh, close down a cycle track and then uh, let the, the bicycles, the cyclists, to find out for themselves, um, but make alternatives. The left uh, picture is the a previous situation and it, it was in front of our office, so it was an easy uh, uh, case. And uh, we talked to, to the guys working uh, there and uh, offered them an alternative. And the, the bottom picture shows what the alternative looked like. And cyclists can go ahead because they were working just in the uh, area between the main street and the bicycle traffic uh, and the bicycle lane, uh, bicycle path. So this would. This is a, a better situation. Uh, they can work protected by their van, uh, or by the yeah by the van, and cyclists can go ahead. Um, and then the, the separation. I, I wonder why in, in the UK, uh, Brian showed an uh, example of the similar orcas. Um, why they place them in the lane for cyclists? Um, it can be a hazard. So why not make space between the main street and the, the protected bike lane and um, Place the separ uh, separation um, things uh, items there. Um, you can also use parking uh, parked cars as a buffer between uh, 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 
cycle lane and the, the main street. And always keep um, the, the, the safe obstacle distance in mind. Cyclists do not cycle very close to um, separation uh, uh, items. They also keep a distance. And then if you place huge um, barriers, uh, you will narrow the space left for cyclists. It's uh, important to keep them in mind. And then uh, the, the curb stones, the road sides, um, don't make them too sharp, make them uh, uh, shallow. Um, introduce road markings so that in a poor uh, light situations, uh, cyclists still know where the um, asphalt is and where the verge starts, um, where they are next to the, the road. No standing water, uh, no puddles in the street. You, you never know how deep it is, so if you have to go through them, you don't know what you will get, uh, how you will survive. And uh, no differences in height. Uh, so if you have uh, asphalt, then make sure that the, uh, the road sides are at the same level. Otherwise, that also could be a very dangerous situation. Well, these were the details that I would uh, give to you uh, to make sure that everything is working in safety. Thanks, Hilly. That's brilliant. Um, really interesting. Getting into the weeds, into the reeds there as well about um, about the technical stuff. We've, um, I'm just looking to see if there's some questions. We've got one on um, education of road users, which I think Brian has uh, has answered. Um, Alex, sharing the road might be solutions, but it must be regulated with specific signs and cameras, so the road as much as cyclists should be aware of. I think that sounds fair enough. Um, and then Alexander from ECF. Hello, Oleg. Um, Hilly, you mentioned design speed of 45. Do you already have concrete par parameters for such speed, such as the horizontal vertical curve, radar, sight distance, um, and visibility on crossings, etc.? Well, most of the um, um, parameters we uh, described in the design manual are based on 45 kilometers per hour. So, okay. um, yeah, you can find them there. Okay. Um, if so, you have them privately, I will uh, send them to, yeah. to him. Brian, you, you mentioned quite a lot the influence of, uh, you know, Dutch or Danish or even Spanish sort of um, uh, design infrastructure measures. How much would you say has that been um, a big influence on, uh, on, on what you do in the UK? And are there sort of certain things that simply would not work in the UK? You look at some of the Danish stuff or the Dutch stuff and you go, that's, that's simply just not going to happen. Yeah, well, it's all, like everybody finds this around the world, really. You look at like a great idea and then you go think, well, how do I use that with my people and my regulations and my behaviour and, you know, and, and the history of the roads? And it's interesting what Martin was saying about the Vienna Convention and we didn't sign up to that. <laughs> so we went off a completely different way there. But yeah, I mean, I, I consider myself from the Dutch school Joy Hilly would very much argue with some of the stuff I do, but I, I definitely uh, take massive inspiration for what they're doing, and I think how can I make that work here you know, with, with our regulations? And sometimes we have to do it in a slightly skewed way. Uh, I know that we've had experiments of trying to do like more Danish approaches, but we need a, a fundamental legal change to get to that kind of level of behaviour. Like I mentioned it in my talk that the yield on turn rule that. The rest of the world has apart from the uk and malta and i think hong kong so there's just certain things that we can't do and we have to find our ways around which are so i, I find that the dutch stuff's a lot more compatible because it's a it is a kind of safety first thing and, and based on protection and uh, particularly at junction so so yeah it's normally about getting good ideas from the dutch then trying to invent them and then preventing it, pretending that I invented them in the UK. That's, uh, <laughs> that's my career summarised. <laughs> Maricin, about it, Poland, what, what do you think? The, 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 the Danish or the, or the Dutch style infrastructure and design, which um, which do you find easier to transpose into, into Poland? Uh, good question. First of all, we've been following the uh, Crow Manual. <laughs> I translated <laughs> Crow Manual into Polish uh, 20 years ago. What I love, uh, there was an agreement with uh, Crow a long time ago between Polish Ecological Club and Crow. Uh, uh, the Crow Manual uh, gives uh, parameters, gives uh, uh, requirements, the five requirements. 
and uh, they can be checked, they can be followed, and they can be uh, flexibly incorporated in street design. And uh, this is uh, quite a uh, good tool uh, that uh, should be followed. Uh, when it comes to uh, Denmark, um, I think um, it uh, can be uh, more difficult to implement uh, because it's a whole system like uh, the left turn uh, in, in Denmark uh, that can be performed uh, only in two stages. Uh, the uh, particular design of cycle track also uh, requires uh, specific cohesion uh, throughout the city, otherwise it would not work or it would lead to some isolated uh, uh, areas with, with such arrangements. But generally, we are at the moment of a, a specific experiment. We are just trying to adopt the rules uh, in uh, various environments because cities are very different. And also, uh, as far as, uh, well, uh, urban structure goes or, or uh, and, and also uh, it depends on policy. So there are more advanced cities and less advanced cities. Uh, well, generally, uh, there's a lot of uh, Dutch uh, know-how uh, that can be and should be followed. Okay. Okay. Um, can I just say quick, I just say quick, on, Brian, as well. Oh, got a bit oh, echoey there. Just really, the, the inspiration for Spain, particularly in the UK, is just how quick they got stuff done, like particularly like the Seville example, when he pretty much changed an entire city within one four-year mayoral term. That That's music to my ears. Uh, and I love that kind of rough and ready, get it all out and get it done. And uh, it takes us back to, a, I think, what probably happened in Holland in the 70s, where we're all trying to make that choice and, and the Spanish stuff, because it happened so quick. It can be so affordable. Um, like, uh, I have to show respect for them. And Hilly, what do you think about this uh, this light infrastructure? I mean, uh, you know, the Dutch sort of leads the way in um, in proper permanent, but the the light infrastructure can be useful if you have a particularly, you know, um, you have to go through all the procedures. You have to find lots of money, and you can find a particular stretch of road where, like in the UK, in London or in Manchester, you can just Whack, put down some armadillos or some poles and all, all, all of a sudden you have a serviceable um, a, a piece of uh, safe infrastructure. What, what would, the, what would your, your opinion be on that? Um, I think it's a good way um, because by showing how it can work in, with um, uh, light uh, equipment, you can convince people who are a bit iffy about introducing all these uh, facilities. You can you, you can show it, and that's the the case with infrastructure. If you build infrastructure for cyclists, you give them their dedicated uh, facilities, then they will they will be there. They will come. Um, also, in places where you hardly see any cyclists, and and uh, maybe policymakers or politicians will say, well, why should we? There isn't anybody. There's no a need for. Um, if you introduce it in a very light and, and, and not so expensive way, um, they will come, and then you can show. Look what's happening, and maybe uh, now now you can uh, have fundings for uh, more permanent situations. But less, so, but less need less needed in the Netherlands. Yeah, less needed in the Netherlands because uh, our um, traffic policy is, is based on uh, the combination of uh, uh, cyclists and, and cars. We are now looking the other uh, way uh, to introduce more facilities for for uh, pedestrians because that's the group uh, we forgot to uh, design properly for. But uh, cyclists and, and cars, they, yeah, that's in our um, DNA. And Madachin, last, uh, last, last minute. Um, have you seen any improvements in Poland from the, I think the 400 million that the Polish government took from EU funding? I was just <laughs> wondering how much, uh, how much uh, progress you've seen in Poland with that, with that money. Uh, well, it's uh, it differs from city to city. Uh, there is no uh, good national policy yet. Maybe there will be one. Uh, there are some regions that are more advanced, like Western Pomeranian region with the tourist uh, infrastructure, Eurovelo routes, also Malpolska region. And there are some progressive cities. I named Poznań with the 8% of traffic uh, by bicycle, which is huge in Poland. 
uh, also of Rostrov, which is very flat. Uh, we are at the kind of experiment uh, stage yet. Uh, various cities follow uh, various approaches. And I think in a couple of years, we'll see uh, some, uh, well, outcomes, some, 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 uh, some results uh, that will show how to use money. Because that's a problem. This is not a problem with the money, but how to spend it on what kind of project. Uh, very few cities in Poland uh, can compare to the level of strategic planning like the Netherlands. Uh, just the network planning and so on and so on. This is very often just uh, stretches of road. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's been a bit of a Dutch loving. Uh, <laughs> all showing their crow manuals and uh, and praising the Dutch. Next time we'll have to ask you the problems we have in the Netherlands, perhaps, Hilly. But um, <laughs> we're going to have to end because it's quarter past. It's a shame because there's this really good, uh, really good panel. It's be a really good panel, I reckon, to um, do uh, again sometime because I know you're all sort of really good experts in your fields in your country. So thanks to you all. It's been uh, really interesting. I hope everyone um, who's watching uh, uh, enjoyed it. And um, thanks very much. And I think we'll end it there. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye.